Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all today uh, on this holiday weekend. I'm glad you could make it. Um, it's been a while so, since I spoke here now on a Sunday, and we've been away for almost a month. It was a, my longest time I've been away from Dharma Field since we opened it. So. <laughs> anyway. But today I thought I'd talk about, um, you know, often there's teachings that are very important that we easily gloss over, skip over. And uh, we don't realize, you know, how important they are, how essential they are to if, if our interest is in waking up, which is my interest, it's my interest in, in, uh, in my teaching, this is what I'm concerned with. Uh, not just for me to be awake, but also to do what I can uh, to point things out for you. And that's it. And... Uh, the, some little aspects of our teaching here and there, they're direct pointers to just this very issue, waking up, realizing, have some sense of what that is. And these are easy to miss. Now, often they just seem trivial or inconsequential or <laughs> just gloss right over them. And one such teaching is one I encountered pretty early on. Uh, one of the, it wasn't the earliest book, but it was pretty early on in, when I started to seriously look into Buddhism as a young person. And it was uh, the old classic uh, book, um, Zen Flesh, Zen Bones. And I'm, I'm sure many of you know that book. A lot of wonderful little stories in there and uh, koans as well and uh, a few other things. But I remember the very first, uh, the first the, there's four parts to the book, I believe. And then there's the first one is like 101 stories, I guess we could say. And the very first one, uh, I remember reading this, encountering it for the first time. And you probably all of you know this story because it shows up elsewhere, not just in Zen flesh and bones. But it's the story of where a, uh, well, I think he's a college professor, goes to see a Zen master. And I believe this is around the year 1900, if I remember right. Uh, so it's not that long ago. Often these stories are from ancient times. And, but he goes to see the, the Zen master and as a typical, <laughs> he goes to see the teacher. And uh, the teacher, if it's just a private one-on-one -on -one meeting, not, not in Dokusan necessarily, but, um, well, it wouldn't be Dokusan, but the teacher will greet you and start pouring you some tea. This is in Japan very common um, little ritual they go through. And um, so here in this case, uh, uh, the teacher greets the professor and begins to pour him tea and uh, fills the cup to the brim and then keeps on pouring until finally now the tea is running all over the table. <laughs> and then the professor says, stop, he said, the, uh, the cup is full, and no more will go in, he said. And then the teacher says, like this cup, your mind is full of your thoughts and ideas, opinions. Uh, no, more, no more will go in. And uh, I remember reading that, first time I encountered that particular image in that story. 
Uh, and I thought, oh, yeah, that uh, seems like there's something to that. <laughs> it did register with me, but uh, I remember that much. But then kind of just fades away. You read other stories, you do other things. You, know, you have a busy life doing this and that. And uh, we just kind of, you know, forget about something like that. That, that story is almost a kind of story be a cliche, but it's uh, would be the word, but it's, it's so common. You hear it a lot. I'm sure you've all heard it in some context or another. But like this cup, your mind is full. Yeah, so you're full of a lot of ideas. And uh, with that, no more will go in, said the teacher. So I was kind of directing our attention to something. And then a story like that, you can say, uh-huh, okay, yeah, I get it. Yeah, okay, now, no more will go in. And then the next time, maybe you're at a talk like this, and somebody will resort to that story, use that story in some manner. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know this one. Yeah, you kind of sit it out until the story is over and then wait for the remarks to come later, perhaps. <laughs> Something like that. We can just easily dismiss this. And we often do. But there are stories or pointers like this. Just something that's pointing directly to something about human experience here that we really need to pay some attention to. And uh, we can easily miss that and say, oh yeah, I, well, I know that, yeah, I know. And then you tell the story yourself on occasion, perhaps. I know the story, yeah. And here's a point I'm making. And I'm trying to get my point across to you and you're not paying attention, <laughs> you kind of draw. And so I'm telling you this story to help you. Yeah, we might use it that way ourselves. Not at all having a clue as to the depth of what this story is pointing out. And of course, the story does it even kind of poorly. Like for example, when the teacher says, like this, uh, like this cup, uh, your mind is full, no more will go in. Well, this is a true teacher. I might be fine talking to a lay person who hasn't really given much consideration to any of these things. And where most of us, even a century ago in Japan, might have the idea that things come into our mind. But that already, to the one who's awake to what's going on here, that image is already incorrect. Of course, they also know that you're not going to supply a correct one. No matter what we say, it doesn't really capture reality. It doesn't capture truth. So no more will go in. So we can learn eventually that well, actually, well, we'll run into other teachings that point that nothing enters or leaves the mind. And of course, we think that's crazy because we hear the mind and we're thinking about, well, my own mind. I get new ideas and I forget other things. And it seems like <laughs> things come and go. But of course, all of this is um, a confused understanding possibly even a confused telling of the story. In that case, the teacher may or may not realize that nothing enters or leaves the mind. Maybe just use that phrase that might be helpful for, for the professor, given his understanding at that time. Yeah, teachers will do that. If you do something like that, though, you got to kind of... <laughs> Keep track of this fellow and make sure they don't get the idea that you're teaching that things enter and leave the mind. But this teaching, uh, there is profound subtlety to it. That is of absolutely, it's imperative, vital importance. That, is, that you understand this. If you're interested in waking up, realizing the nature of reality, you have to realize, well, you will realize, it isn't, it isn't realizing what this story is playing out. 
on its most subtle level. We can talk about it as having levels. But we encounter this same teaching elsewhere too. It's like when uh, Dogen, Zenji, going back, this is a, what I just told you, I think it was roughly around the year 1900. We go back to Dogen, he's 13th century, Japan. And he says, and this is a teaching I've offered many times. But again, another teaching that maybe not so easily gets dismissed like the one about pouring the teacup might strike a little harder, stick around a little bit perhaps. You might give some thought to it. Not that it needs to be given thought, but just look at it, be aware of it. We had someone like Dogen, a very profound, deep, enlightened mind, says something like this to his monks, tells them point blank directly. I tell you, old monks, the reason you don't wake up is because you don't relinquish your views. Maybe that's a more powerful way of reiterating what was going on in that story of the teacup. I tell you, monks, if you're here, he's talking to not just lay people, but it's monks, those who are um, training with him, practicing with him. So ostensibly, they have a very serious mind and intent at taking this up and really waking up to what's taking place here. And he said, I tell you the reason you don't wake up. And a lot of people think it's hard to wake up. We have a story about that with Suzuki Roshi. He says, yeah, people think it's hard to become enlightened. He said, well, that, that's, that's not so difficult. <laughs> or to maintain this practice. Anybody can do that. What is difficult is to keep your mind pure. It's actually quite related to these stories of the teacup and what Wang Paul said, or what Dogen said, I should say. Now we can go back further too, uh, to Wang Po, since I mentioned him, where he says another teaching that I've given you, but he said, uh, if you don't w awake to this mind, to reality, you know, his mind, Blofeld does a nice job. He puts it in a capital M. Because it isn't your mind. It's, it's another word for reality, truth, dharma. Capital M mind, not your mind, not my mind. Reality. But he says, I tell you, you know, uh, uh, if you don't awaken to this mind, he said, uh, you will seek for Buddha, you will seek for enlightenment outside yourself. You will attach the forms and pious practices and so on, robes and rituals and any number of things. He says, which is harmful, he says. He's being very direct here. So direct, I would say, don't ever forget this passage by Wang Po. If you're interested in waking up, if you're not interested in waking up, I guess it doesn't matter. But he said, this stuff is harmful. And then he says, and not at all the way to supreme knowledge of reality. I added that part, but this is not knowledge with a capital K, not knowledge of, you know, how to lay a floor here or how to build a building or, you know, plant potatoes. I mean, supreme knowledge, knowledge, the knowing, the understanding, the realization of reality itself directly. That will spare you all the agony and 
confusion and fear and trembling and longing and loathing and anger and, and uh, heartache. That is all mixed in with everything we experience because we don't see the nature of reality. If you're interested in this, if this is your interest to wake up, then don't attach to these things. Don't seek them out, don't use them. Even these teachings, even what Wang Po says, even what Dogen says, I tell you, uh, the reason you don't wake up is you're attached to, you're holding views. Well, what kind of views? You're holding views, period. Well, I have to hold, no, you don't. You can use them to do the different things that we need to do in human life. <laughs> At least some things, you don't have to do everything. There's just some things you can do that are very harmful. One poet was pointing out. You don't need to do those things. But we need to do things like plant potatoes and eat potatoes. And also, you, you can list the things that are necessary. And you say, well, potatoes aren't necessary. You could eat other things. Yeah, yeah. And we'll do stuff like that. When these teachings are pointing out, we'll say, well, here's an exception here. Yeah, well, you can always pick apart whatever is said, even Dharma teaching. The Dharma teaching, if it is true Dharma teaching, with a capital D, it's always pointing to this reality that you cannot grasp in words, in concepts, that's why we have Dogen saying, cease from practice based on intellectual understanding. Yeah, we need some conceptual intellectual understanding of various things in our daily life. But if you're interested in not being confused about what's going on here, then listen to what these teachers are pointing out. Take it seriously, take it to heart. And it, what do you have to do about that? Not, not much. Just pay attention to your own mind, your own heart. Don't lose sight of that. If you do, and, and you will, and I do too. You've I've known this teaching I'm giving you now for a long time now, and yet I still will lose track. <laughs> But we can come back. And over time, this is the practice. You bring yourself back, you realize you're off, bring yourself back. You, know, you bring yourself back. It's not about you get to that pl place where you're just never off. You know, you're always here. Well, I don't know if anybody can actually, I mean, it's possible, I don't know. But that's not the point. The point is to understand this nature of how we drift off in our minds, seeking this, seeking that, even taking up this kind of teaching and practice and thinking there's something here for me to grasp and to get hold of and to acquire, get the robes and the certificates and whatever to prove it, you know, prove what? <laughs> Outward show of some kind? But the thing is, and the way we'll miss this, what's being pointed out here, well, it's all in all kinds of subtle ways. Just recently, I received an email from someone who um, said, um, how was it? I thought I'd remember that. <laughs> um, Was, it was something like this, he, he, he said to me, it was to me directly, but, well, if you don't believe in good and evil, you know, 
Uh, and how can you justify this? And, and I, I, don't, I don't remember another phrase. I'm sorry. <laughs> I should have brought it in. I thought I remember, but it was something like that. Somehow, somewhere, could have been in one of my books where I said something. He didn't quote or give me the direct thing that I either said or wrote or something. But, um, but gleaned from my teaching somewhere that I don't believe uh, there's good and evil. And, uh, you know, and I, can, I can see how someone could understand that from my teaching and the way I talk and, and stuff like this. But I also know, I know my mind and I know <laughs> that uh, unless I made a mistake or slipped while I was speaking or something, uh, I don't think I would have said that uh, because I don't think that way. And so I wrote back, I said, well, I, I don't believe that there's no good or evil. But then, of course, and I didn't have time to write, there was other things in the letter that I responded to, but there was a whole bunch right there that I could have responded to. Perhaps uh, that person is listening to this or will be listening. And I can maybe say a little bit about it now because in the way I answered, you know, I, well, I, I don't believe that there's no good or evil, but what is important that uh, would be helpful to understand what I had to say about that is that I did not say that I believe in good and evil. See, the, when, when we're speaking, this, this Dharma teaching, when we're just pointing at reality, at truth, uh, this is why you can't grab, this is why the professor pouring the tea and Dogen saying, I tell you monks, you know, because you, you, you hang on to your views, etc. And Wang Po and others. Um, when Dharma teaching, this kind of pointing is being said, of course, language itself is dualistic. As soon as you say something, particularly if it has some kind of a balanced nature to it against some other idea, like the is and then the is not kind of, kind of a balance or something. Uh, then if, if you say this, then it sounds like you're over here for most people, that's what they're assuming, that's what they're hearing. Over the 30 some, I don't know how many years I've been teaching now, but um, that I've taught, it comes back to me. Again, again, all kinds of ways. You said this. I don't, I don't know that I did. I mean, I don't remember the occasion. Uh, I might have slipped and said something like that. But if you listen, if you come back and hear my teaching again, again, I, I think you can see that where you went with that isn't where I was going or where I'm coming from. I don't know where I'm coming. I'm not coming from any place really. And I'm not trying to direct you to any place. I'm trying to help you wake up. But the point I'm making now is that if something like that is said, you could, something could be said that it sounds like, oh, so then you're, you're, where you're coming from is over here. If that isn't stated, don't do that. Not with Dharma teaching. And you can't always, you know, it'd become very cumbersome speech or talk or whatever. If every time you say, you say that you have to you have the counterpoint. But if you come back again and again to this kind of teaching, at some point you can begin to realize that you want to stick with, particularly if it is Dharma teaching, stick with what is being pointed out. Don't assume anything else that's connected to that like it's flipped or it agrees with it or whatever it might be. That hasn't been pointed out. You might think it's implied in it. And not, no, not really. This is an important uh, thing to bear in mind. 
if you're concerned with, as Dogen says, to relinquish views or to not attach to them in the first place. As Juan Po was kind of pointing out. This is important. Then your mind can remain free enough, or at least more free, to more easily see what's actually unfolding here. The kind of confusion that is in our thinking and that we use all the time in, in all kinds of discourse and just everyday talk and the assumptions that are there, we can begin to see those things as just assumptions that you're making on your part. Just recently, I was talking to, with someone who has studied Zen for a long time. And yet at some point, um, I, I did make a statement of some sort of, of this nature. And they immediately assumed that I was uh, embracing a certain set of views that uh, I find them, you know, that's, uh, that other set of views uh, a little more free and open perhaps, but I don't hang on to any of them too tightly. But then, you know, kind of jumping on me that I was holding these views when I wasn't holding uh, anything at all, really. I was just questioning your views. Does that make sense? I'm not saying your views are wrong. I'm just asking you, does that make sense? If that were the case, wouldn't this also be the case? We can do things like that. But what we can't do, if not if you're interested in living out of awakeness, is to take hold of a particular view, no matter what it is. You know, a political view or uh, you know, a religious view, philosophical, anything. A factual view even that, well, is that, are those really the facts? So just be careful with all of these things. But what you can do is you can learn to not hang on to views. And Dawkins says relinquish them. Often you'll see that in the teachings. It's just totally give them up. That's pretty hard to do, but it might be helpful. And this is what I'm trying to get across today here, is that this is very important to realize that any view you are holding, as simple and inconsequential as it might seem, um, it is important that you don't uh, grasp it beyond some just some little utilitarian, uh, you know, purpose that it has in the moment or something like that. Uh, maybe use it briefly and then set it down, let it go. This is extremely important if you're interested in waking up. Because if you can't do it, if you can't catch yourself in some particular uh, framework, um, well, this is bondage. This is, and this is delusion. This is to be caught. This is what Suzuki Roshi meant. With, this is what is difficult, keeping your mind pure. Not that you have holy thoughts or something like this, but you, you're aware of that you're grasping this or you're grasping that. Or you think that the, dhar the Dharma, the source of the Dharma teaching, whether it's a person or in a book that actually is pointing, is actually coming from some particular point, trying to make a particular point. This is something uh, years ago, I haven't taught in Nagarjuna in quite a while now, but some of you know that we had quite a bit of that Nagarjuna here. It's a 30 week course that I used to teach on it. And uh, several, some of you went to it several times. But um, 
Uh, and there, we're looking at, this is what Nagarjuna is showing us how, here's a view that Buddhists would have from his day, second century, roughly. And uh, he'd show that it doesn't hold up, doesn't hang together, doesn't make sense. This can't be so. And he does it over and over and over again. That's all his, his masterwork, the Mula Majamaka, Mula Majamaka Krika. Uh, that's what it takes us through. Every chapter has got the word pariksa is in the title, means examination. So he's just looking at this view, <coughs> looking at that one, the next one. And views about the Four Noble Truths, views about time, views about uh, uh, motion. motion, yeah, <laughs> and all sorts of things. And, uh, uh, but it's just examination. But in taking people th through the course, invariably, and he's just showing what these views don't hold up, this interpretation here. So what's Nagarjuna? What's he going to give us there? When are we going to get to that? What's his point? But he doesn't. He goes through the entire book, which is just examination of examination of examination. Of. It isn't like the last chapter says, here are the answers, <laughs> something like that. That is it. And this is an important, just that alone, that's an important teaching all by itself. That the awakened aren't trying to bring us to an answer aren't trying to bring us to a thought of a constructed idea of some sort or any, any constructed form. That's what Wang Po warned us about. Whether it's a physical form or a, a formed idea or thought, feeling, whatever it might be. You can experience these things, be open to them, enjoy them, and let them live in the absolute flowing change that everything is a part of without grasping anything, solidifying it, make it, making it solid, making it as if it's something now that persists from moment to moment. And that includes yourself. You see yourself in that way that I'm persisting, I'm moving along. I'm changing, yes, I'm changing, but But when we think that way, that there's something there to grasp, that we don't want to relinquish, well, this is true. We have these uh, political fights. This is true, this is true. The people on the TV telling us what is true. You can see truth, reality. We all can, directly, and you do. You, <laughs> what you experience directly, moment by moment, nanosecond by nanosecond, is reality, is truth, dharma. But the reason we don't wake up to this, says Dogen, is because we're holding views. We're, hold, we're in that stream trying to carry on as if we got something here solid here, we're everything streaming past not realizing that the very thing that we think is so right and true and real and solid is also stream itself. If you examine it carefully as Nagarjuna would direct us to do, you, you can see that. Well, then what do I hang on to? You might think, well, <laughs> you've never been hanging on to anything. Is there a problem? That's what life is. not about preserving you or anything else. It is just this vibrant, what can I say? Nothing holding still. But it's a matter of, of seeing that. And to the extent that our minds are loaded with frozen ideas, frozen views, the Buddha, all the way back to the time of the Buddha, he warned of that, pointed that out. Things that are frozen, you know, we, we feel comforted. If I finally find something that'll last, it'll make me feel comfortable. No, it, won't, it doesn't. 
Because in the back of your mind, you know, you know reality. There's nothing holding still there at all. It doesn't seem to occur to us that that's how it is. That this is happening at all. Mind, consciousness. Because nothing is holding still. This is what life is. And if we just finally see that, this is what we've always experienced. This is what is experienced now. This is the only kind of experience there is. It's just that. Uh, and we, awaken, we awaken to a great freedom that seemed to be locked away from us. It never was, but seemed to be for so long. So this matter then of uh, the teacher pouring the cup of tea <laughs> and saying, you know, and the man, the man says, you know, stop, no more will go in. Yeah, it's, it's overflowing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is overflowing all the time anyway. But you have to empty all the stuff that you're hanging on to in your mind searching after this and to get that kind of uh, accreditation or whatever. These things might be yeah, necessary in some limited way. But understand, see them for what they are, all of these things. Don't hang on to them. Don't identify. Then as Juan Paul says, all of these things are harmful. If you hang on to them. If you don't hang on to them, but then now it sounds like I'm giving you a way out. Well, yeah, you can experience all these things as long as you don't hang on to them. Well, <laughs> and we can set it up for ourselves. So we think, well, I'm not hanging on to these. Yeah, I know they're you know, temporary and changeable and all of this. Yeah, I'm not hanging on. Well, look at that. What do you mean by I? Hang on, there's something right there. So just recognize when this is taking place in the mind. And um, it's not that you can keep catching it moment, but as I said, I can't do that. But we can get a little better over time after we, if, once we, we really see that this is the nature of all everything's unfolding here. Little by little, we can get uh, maybe a little better at letting go of things not grasping, grasping them in the first place. Well, maybe I've said enough on that this morning. Do you have any questions about anything I said? <laughs> Anybody out there in Zoom land? Nothing? Yes, Mary. So, not to what you said, what you, I heard you say was true Dharma teaching comes from no held view of a position whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And, that, and that's important then to remember because when we'll hear even Dharma teaching, there's nothing meant for us to take hold of there. And yet we will take hold of things. And this, again, this is why Suzuki Roshi made that bizarre statement. It's there in his book, Zen Mind. I'm pretty sure it's in Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. Yes, it is. Yeah, and where he says, uh, uh, you know, when my talk is over, your listening is over. There's no need to remember what I said. <laughs> when, when I first read that, uh, the, what's the point, you know? Yeah. He does go on to say, that's because you already know. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, and, and, and that's, that's what Dharma teaching is. It's kind of like a reminder. See, and pointing out the things, you know, and it's what I was attempting to do this morning, is just point out things that can strike you as oddly familiar, even though it doesn't seem like a way I've ever looked at this before, and yet it can strike us in that way, because we do know. This is why, as I said too at the beginning, nothing to the awakened, they realize nothing actually enters or leaves the mind. Of course, that's the mind of reality, but truly that's your mind as well. You do know everything. Well, it isn't you that knows everything, but the, for uh, uh, any uh, 
sense that we might have of myself here, you're not missing anything at all. You know, there's nothing you need to acquire. There's nothing you need to show or demonstrate. It's just a matter of from moment to moment, just seeing and not grasping, not interpreting anything, not making a form of anything, a graspable of anything. If you do, just be aware of what you're doing. Use it only in a limited way and then set it down again. Don't ever try to hook another person on that. Any kind of a teacher who's trying to sell you on a point or, or uh, anything like this, or worse, uh, worse than that, is where they, they want you to uh, attach to them, something like this. That's a dead giveaway. <laughs> that, uh, or even like in our political scene here, you know, where we're entering into an age where thing, times are becoming more and more uncertain and kind of scary for a lot of people and uncertain. And so we have now these political, for lack of a better word, I guess I don't like this phrase, but uh, these political strong men, I suppose they're always men, but uh, the strength is in the bluster and, and in the, you know, just uh, grasping after power. And that's right. But we look to a dictator, somebody like that, you know, who can get things done, you know, and we do that out of fear. But uh, all of that is coming from, I mean, we don't even recognize that. And uh, it's from your grasping yourself, you want to be protected and you go rushing right toward the very thing that's probably the most dangerous thing you can do <laughs> for your own personal protection. And um, all of these kinds of things. But that's all, uh, you know, just grasping. And um, it doesn't matter what, what the source is, even with a Dharma teacher or an apparent, uh, is this a Dharma teacher or not? Be very careful with that. If they're trying to sell you on a point, well, I have the answer. You, you, just watch for that. These things are alluring. And for some people, you know, very alluring. But that's a dead giveaway. You realize you, <laughs> you're responsible for your own life and for your own awakening. And it's just something you can do. I can't do it for you. My teacher couldn't do it for me. Uh, so you don't need someone else in that way. It is helpful for someone to point some of these things out for us. But if anything is being handed in such a way as that, here, I've got something here. Now you work on this and then I'll take a little. It, it certainly isn't, is not Dogen's way. This is Soto Zen, you know, which is what we have here, more or less. <laughs> but there's no graduated, uh, you know, thing where you go from say one koan to the next or the whatever. You're not going up a chain. That's how life that, that resembles life in the, in the world of delusion and confusion and the samsaric world of coming and going and birth and death and all of that. Any Dharma teaching, Dharma, Dharma could just mean teaching, but that would direct us to follow something on, on that sort is misguided. And I would say it can be very dangerous. But that even involves things like, you know, you know, putting on the robes and, and all sorts of things there. On the other hand, I don't mean to just dismiss these things out of hand either. But, uh, but what it really comes down to at any given moment is, is, is there's you. This is your mind. You wake up. You see this. As my teacher used to say, the final job of the teacher is to free the student of the teacher. Which isn't to say that you don't need a teacher. I, I was very happy and grateful that I encountered uh, such a teacher. I'm speaking of Karagiri Roshi. He straightened me out on a lot of subtle things that I don't know that I, on my own, would have ever seen through. But in the end, he didn't explain anything to me or whatever. Most of it was he was pointing out where, kind of like with Nagarjuna, this doesn't make sense. You know, what I'm holding here, how I'm interpreting this or whatever. 
He never said something like, here, look at it this way or do this or whatever. So, but if, if, if you have uh, somebody that was really trying to direct you around rather than helping you to slow down and look, watch, pay attention. And this paying attention isn't, don't pay attention to all that stuff. Watch, in particular, watch the leanings of your mind, your, your mind wanting to go in this direction or that. Watch that. Don't try to stop it from doing that. That's just more leaning. But just, this is what you need to wake up to. And it's not that difficult, as Suzuki Roshi said. It's not that hard to, you know, to become enlightened. What's hard is keeping your mind pure, not being taken by this or that. And it's across the board, it's everything, everything. That's the other thing I wanted to get right. The most minute little thing here. You know, that's how important this is. Just watch what, watch what you're doing. Watch what you have a tendency to do. It's not just you have a tendency to do this. We all do. We all, we, it might not be the exact same thing, but we're always reaching after something. And beyond some limited use it might provide for the moment, and let it go again. Don't define yourself as anything. That's why I also tell people, you know, you want to take the precepts and all that. And here myself, I've been ordained. I've had transmission, all of that. But uh, nothing here to identify with. In my most recent book, uh, the person I'm having a conversation with there says, well, you, so you're Buddhist. And I said, I've never claimed that. <laughs> I may have in my very early days of taking this stuff up. I don't even remember anymore. So long ago, I started to realize that just take this up. You don't have to label it. The moment you do it, you just, can you see you're creating a form? All of which is harmful and not at all the way to supreme knowledge. Wang Po isn't just talking, he's pointing. Out. So just be careful about it. And I'm not saying, don't ever do that, man. That's creating something else now. Just see, learn to see and not grasp. That's all. And then when it's time to eat, then eat and it's time to sleep or go to work or whatever it might be. Just take care of that as best you can. So this is very simple. What's being pointed out here which isn't to say that it is easy to do. You have to work at it, but you also have to wake up to know, understand the subtle thing that's being pointed out here and see that in your own heart and mind, your own behavior here, right there. And I'm pointing this out. I'm not pointing it out as say, like, look at me. I look at how perfect that, because I don't, I don't, I don't, I've never said that. But I, I am saying this is the way to do this. This is what this is what the assignment is. It's very subtle, <laughs> but you have to really bring yourself back to it again and again and again and again. I've been at this over fifty years now, and still the same thing again and again. <laughs> Just keep coming back. I don't have to come back maybe from such distant places as I once did, or that's, you know, or being tossed about and that, but still going, just keep coming back, coming back. There's no end to this. But at some point we can realize a freedom in our mind uh, that otherwise eludes us. That freedom is actual knowing. Or as Wang Po alluded to there, a supreme, no knowing supreme knowledge. There's a meaning there's nothing beyond this. It's total. But, but it isn't a thing. It isn't an idea. It isn't a concept. It's just a realizing of what's going on. In a sense, words fail. Anything else? I'm rambling on here. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, well, thank you. <laughs>